We now want to jump over to Tel Aviv and Israel. You see Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is speaking there after meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had, uh, earlier today. Let's discussions listen. discussions with the Prime Minister and national security leaders on the status of the military campaign uh, to defeat Hamas and on the progress toward achieving the fundamental objective of ensuring that October 7th never happens again. At the same time, we're continuing to work closely with Israel and Lebanon on diplomatic efforts to de-escalate tensions on Israel's northern border so that families can return to their homes, both in northern Israel and in southern Lebanon, and live in peace and security. We also discussed the imperative of maximizing civilian protection and humanitarian aid to address the ongoing suffering of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Nearly two million people have been displaced from their homes. Hundreds of thousands are experiencing acute hunger. Most have lost someone that they love. And day after day, more people are killed. On all of my previous visits here, and pretty much every day in between, we have pressed Israel in concrete ways to strengthen civilian protection, to get more assistance to those who need it. And over the past four months, Israel has taken important steps to do just that, starting the flow of aid, doubling it during the first pause for hostage releases, opening the north and south corridors in Gaza so that people could move out of immediate harm's way through these corridors with four hours uh, pause every day, three hours notice, opening Karem Shalom, starting the flow of assistance from Jordan, establishing deconfliction mechanisms for humanitarian sites. As a result, today, more assistance than ever is moving into Gaza from more places than at any time since October 7th. As the largest donor of humanitarian aid to the Palestinians, the United States has helped provide much of that assistance, including funding 90,000 metric tons of flour delivered from Ashdod port. That's enough to provide bread for 1.4 million people for the next five months. Uh, a UN team began its mission to the north to assess conditions for the civilians who are still there, as well as what needs to be done to allow displaced Palestinians to return back home to the north. And yet, as I said to the Prime Minister and to other Israeli officials today, the daily toll that its military operations continue to take on innocent civilians remains too high. In our discussions today, I highlighted some key steps that Israel should take to ensure that more aid reaches more people in Gaza. Israel should open a res so that assistance can flow to northern Gaza, where, as I said, hundreds of thousands of people are struggling to survive under dire conditions. It should expedite the flow of humanitarian assistance from Jordan. It should strengthen deconfliction and improve coordination with the humanitarian providers. And Israel must ensure that the delivery of life-saving assistance to Gaza is not blocked for any reason by anyone. We urge Israel to do more to help civilians, knowing full well that it faces an enemy that would never hold itself to those standards, an enemy that cynically embeds itself among men, women, and children, and fires rockets from hospitals, from schools, from mosques, from residential buildings, an enemy whose leaders surround themselves with hostages, an enemy that has declared publicly its goal to kill as many innocent civilians as it can simply because they are Jews and to wipe Israel off the map. That's why we've made clear that Israel is fully justified in confronting Hamas and other terrorist organizations. And that's why the United States has done more than any other country to support Israel's right to ensure that October 7th never happens again. Israelis were dehumanized in the most horrific way on October 7th. The hostages have been dehumanized every day since. But that cannot be a license to dehumanize others. The overwhelming majority of people in Gaza had nothing to do with the attacks of October 7th. And the families in Gaza whose survival depends on deliveries of aid from Israel are just like our families. Their mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, 
want to earn a decent living, send their kids to school, have a normal life. That's who they are. That's what they want. And we cannot, we must not lose sight of that. We cannot, we must not lose sight of our common humanity. We remain determined as well to pursue a diplomatic path to a just and lasting peace and security for all in the region, and notably for Israel. And that diplomatic path continues to come into ever sharper focus as I travel throughout the region and talk to all of our friends and partners. An Israel that's fully integrated into the region with normal relations with key countries, including Saudi Arabia, with firm guarantees for its security, alongside a concrete, time-bound, irreversible path to a Palestinian state living side by side in peace and security with Israel with the necessary security assurances. Over the course of this trip, we discussed both the substance and sequence of steps that all would need to take to make this path real. That includes steps by the Palestinian Authority to reform and revitalize itself. And I reaffirmed the imperative of those steps in my meeting today with President Abbas. Chief among them, improving governance, increasing accountability to the Palestinian people, reforms that the Palestinian Authority is committed to make in a recently announced reform package, and that we urge it to implement swiftly. Now, we can see so many of the actors in the region lining up to move down the path that I just described. But some are not. Some are trying to sabotage that path. Iran and its proxies continue to escalate and expand the cycle of violence that we all want to break. We'll continue to defend our people. We'll continue to defend our interests in the face of such attacks, not to fuel escalation, but to prevent it. Finally, in my discussions today with the Prime Minister and senior officials, I also raised our profound concerns about actions and rhetoric, including from government officials, that inflame tensions, that undercut international support, and place greater strains on Israel's security. The people of Israel have sacrificed enormously to forge this nation and to defend it. They'll ultimately decide the right path to take and whether they're ready to make difficult choices necessary to realize the vision of the long elusive prospect of true peace and true security. As a true friend of Israel, as the country that has always been first to its side, whether that was May 14th, 1948, or October 7th, 2023, we will always offer our best advice on the choices before the, this country, especially the ones that matter the most. Thank you. Happy to take some questions. The first question goes to Zolan Connell youngs with the New York Times. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the question. I uh, just have a couple for you here. Um, uh, I know that you said there's still room for agreement in terms of the uh, negotiations over the release of hostages, uh, but the Prime Minister, after you spoke with him, uh, pretty bluntly dismissed Hamas's response, um, describing it even as ludicrous. I just want to clarify, is this response or these negotiations uh, DOA at this point? Um, and what specifically did the Prime Minister uh, object to in that response. Uh, also, the Prime Minister, shortly after you met with him, uh, made clear that Israeli troops will be moving deeper into Rafah. Uh, will the United States simply stand by um, as this action is pursued, um, even with one million Palestinians, more than a million Palestinians, uh, being held or in Rafah, seemingly with nowhere to go? Uh, and if I may, Congress is now moving ahead with a bill that would pair aid for Ukraine with aid for Israel. Would the administration endorse any potential package that once again prohibits UNRWA funding? Thank you. That's impressive. Now, I'm, I'm taking it that that includes the questions of all of your colleagues as well. Is that right? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Couldn't do that. <laughs> all right. Um, starting with the, with the first part. Look, as I said, um, we've looked very carefully 
at what came back from Hamas, and there are clearly non-starters in, uh, in what, it, uh, uh, what it's put forward. Um, but we also see space in uh, what came back uh, to pursue negotiations to see if we can get to, uh, to an agreement. And that's what we intend to do. Um, and I'm not going to speak for uh, Israel or anyone else involved, but uh, again, we, we, we believe the space is there and we believe that we should pursue it. Um, with regard to Rafa, look, as I said uh, before, Israel has the responsibility, has the obligation to do everything possible to ensure that civilians are protected uh, and that they get the assistance they need uh, in the course of this conflict. Um, any military campaign, military operation that Israel undertakes needs to put civilians first and foremost in mind. Um, and I suggested, uh, again, some ways to do that. Um, and that's especially true in the case of Rafah, where there are somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 million people, many of them displaced from other parts of, uh, of Gaza. So uh, we want to make sure, again, that in anything that's, uh, that's done, in any uh, military operations, the situation for civilians is first and foremost in mind, and that the necessary steps are taken to make sure that they're protected and they have the assistance they need. Hmm? You suggested some ways to do that. Well, I just, went through, I just went through a number of things that uh, we urge Israel to do now on the uh, building on what it's already done in terms of both humanitarian assistance and civilian protection. Um, and as I said, with, in the case of, Ra of Rafa itself, uh, that's a, extremely important because it has such a dense population, including many people who've been displaced from other parts of, uh, of Gaza. Um, and on, uh, on UNRWA, look, the, we were deeply concerned by the allegations that uh, were made about the participation or involvement of some of its employees in, the, in October 7th. And it's imperative that, as the UN has said it's doing, that there be a thorough investigation, that there be clear accountability, and that there be clear measures put in place to make sure that um, this can't happen again, this, uh, that personnel working for it uh, were not in any way involved in terrorism or the events of October 7th. Um, we know that the work that UNRWA performs, the functions that it performs, have to be preserved because uh, so many lives are depending on it. Uh, and so going forward, we're going to look to the actions that are taken. Um, and as I said, it's Im imperative that the functions be preserved. It sounds like the administration then would potentially support an aid package that still prohibited funding for UNRWA. I'm, I'm not going to get a, ahead of our views on hypothetical pieces of legislation. Although there was Thank already you. an aid package that the, in, the administration endorsed that I'll, prohibited that funding. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to the next time. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. For the next question, Gil Tamri with Channel 13. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, thank you for the opportunity. Gil Tamari, Channel 13. It seems to be that the entire Biden doctrine vis-a-vis -vis Israel, a future Palestinian state, and normalization with Saudi Arabia is collapsing. Netanyahu says no with capital N to any form of a Palestinian state. Saudi Arabia says a normalization with Israel will only be considered after an independent Palestinian state is formed in the 1967 borders, which is Jerusalem as its capital. So how does the U.S. intend to break this uh, deadlock? And uh, secondly, uh, regarding uh, uh, the hostage deal, uh, after we listen uh, tonight to Prime Minister Netanyahu that says that uh, Hamas's uh, demands are delusional, mm. uh, how do you find the space, as you mentioned, uh, for negotiation? And uh, do you feel that Netanyahu is exhausting every possible option to bring back the Israeli citizens kidnapped and held hostage by Hamas? Mm. Or again, Israeli politics is intervening? Mm. And lastly, why did you cancel the, your visit tomorrow to Kerem, to Kerem Shalom? So this is good. We have a, I think we have a trend going of at least three questions for 
question. Uh, yeah. um, uh, last question first. Uh, there was no planned visit to Karim Shalom, so there was nothing to, uh, to cancel. Um, one of the things we want to make sure, as well as I said, uh, is that assistance be able to move smoothly and uh, sustainably, uh, but uh, there was nothing to cancel. Second, um, I guess I'll go in reverse order. On the uh, hostage agreement, again, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I can only repeat myself. Uh, clearly, clearly, there are um, things that Hamas sent back that are absolute non-starters, and I assume that's what the Prime Minister was referring to, but I don't want to speak for him. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we see in, uh, in what was sent back uh, space to continue to pursue uh, an agreement. And um, th these things are always uh, negotiations. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not flipping a light switch. It's not yes or no. There's invariably back and forth. And as I said, we see the, we see the space for that. And given the imperative, given the importance that we all attach to bringing the hostages home, uh, we're intent on, on pursuing it. Uh, finally, as I've said before, um, you know, we were, before October 7th, uh, pursuing uh, the possibility of normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And in fact, I was scheduled to come to Israel and to Saudi Arabia, I believe it was on October 10th, to, uh, to pursue that, and in particular, to focus on what we already knew back then was a necessary Palestinian component to any normalization agreement. Um, when I saw the Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia just uh, a couple of days ago, he repeated to me his um, desire and determination to pursue normalization. But he also repeated uh, that in order to do that, two things uh, need to happen. Uh, one, there needs to be calm in Gaza. Two, uh, there needs to be a clear and credible pathway to a Palestinian state. So, as I said before, you can see the path forward for Israel and for the entire region with integration, with normalization, with security assurances, with the pathway to a, a Palestinian state that entirely changes the equation and the future for the better, for Israelis, for Arabs, for Palestinians, and in so doing, isolates groups like Hamas, isolates countries like Iran that want a very different future. But as I also said, going down that path Pursuing it requires hard decisions. None of this is easy. And so it will be up to Israelis to decide what they want to do, uh, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. We, no one's going to make those decisions for them. All that we can do is to show what the, the possibilities are, what the options are, what the future could be, and compare it to the alternative. And the alternative right now uh, looks like an endless cycle of violence uh, and destruction and despair. Um, we know where the better path lies, but I don't minimize in any way the very difficult decisions that would need to be made by all concerned to travel down that path. Anton LaGuardia with The Economist. Thank you very much, Secretary. Um, can you, uh, you've used some very specific words uh, on, in describing this vision for a better path. What do you actually mean by clear, credible, irreversible, time-bound path to a Palestinian state? Um, and in, in Qatar, and again today, you spoke about security, Israel receiving security guarantees and assurances from its neighbors. What does that actually mean? What's on the table for Israel if it goes down this path? And would that include additional U.S. assurances to Israel on top of the arrangements that currently exist? Thank you. 
Look, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, get ahead of things or get into um, specifics. I think those those words speak for themselves. How they're how they're defined, how they're made real, that's the subject of, uh, of diplomacy. Uh, it's very much the subject of the conversations that I've been having in the region, um, as well as here, as we um, flesh that out and give real substance to it. But I don't want to get uh, ahead of it. Uh, what, I can, what I can only add in, in response to the, the rest of your question is, it's clear to me from talking to um, many of the countries in the region that they're prepared to do things with and for Israel that they were never prepared to do uh, in the past, including um, steps that would uh, further address any security concerns it might have. And similarly, uh, the United States is prepared to do that too. Uh, but the, the details of that, the substance of that, these are all things that we continue to talk about in, in these conversations, in our diplomacy, and we'll bring it into ever sharper focus. Because at some point, yes, it will be very important to uh, put forward exactly uh, those details and see if, uh, for all parties concerned, there is um, a credible pathway to walk down. Um, and again, I believe that there is, uh, but there remains a lot of work to be done. Uh, in the uh, the weeks and months ahead. The final question goes to Mohammed Jamjoum with Al Jazeera English. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Um, I have two issues I want to ask you about. The first is uh, regarding the fact that you've spoken about the importance of creating a pathway for a Palestinian mm -hmm. state. There have been reports that you've asked the State Department <coughs> to review options on potentially recognizing a Palestinian state. So I want to ask you if that's the case. And if so, is that a type of pressure point that you feel is needed to get Israel to agree to a ceasefire and one that could ultimately lead to a two-state solution? That's the first issue. Mm -hmm. Second issue I want to ask you about is the fact that Israel has maintained that Hamas needs to be eliminated, that it cannot have any role in governing Gaza after the war has ended. Where does the U.S. currently stand on this? Is it in any way acceptable to the U.S. for Hamas to be playing a role in governing Gaza in a day-after scenario? And what would U.S. policy be toward Hamas going forward? Uh, the short answer to the second part of the question is no. Um, as to the first part of the question, look, as I just said, there are a number, uh, as, we're, as we're defining the, the path forward, including the pathway to uh, a Palestinian state, uh, there are a number of policy options that people may propose as part of that process. Uh, but our focus today is on all of the diplomacy needed to bring it about, including, again, getting uh, ideas, getting proposals from, from all concerned, and putting those together in a credible uh, and, and clear plan. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, and as I said, we'll continue to have these conversations to engage in that diplomacy to really sharpen the focus on all of the different elements that would be necessary, uh, that would be involved, um, and uh, that each of the parties uh, believes is, uh, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and apologies for keeping folks late. Hope you get a chance to have some dinner. Thanks. All right. We just heard from Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking in Tel Aviv. He reinforced the need for a two-state solution with a Palestinian state living side by side in peace with Israel, in his words. And he said that there also needs to be a security guarantee and normalized relations for Israel in the region. Lincoln discussed humanitarian efforts to help protect civilians in Gaza, as well as those ceasefire talks, saying that there is no space to that there is in fact space to pursue negotiations. Though he said some of those requests that they received from Hamas were quote non-starters. That's right, and you heard there the Secretary of State also saying that Hamas surrounding itself with hostages while they attack Israel, that will not stand, and that uh, October 7th must never happen again. He said, while hostages have been dehumanized, there must not be attacks on civilians in the region, and that, quote, we must not lose sight of that.